So I'm going to talk a little bit more just from the perspective of someone of my generation. Um, what does October mean to me and why do I think it should matter to other people like me? You know, I'm a pretty normal-ish, <laughs> middle class, mother of one, perfectly good job, got a house, got a family. Why is it living in the imperialist heartlands that I should give a monkeys about the socialist revolution and about standing here today to celebrate the 91st anniversary of the October Revolution, something that happened thousands of miles away, 90 years ago, to people very far removed from the I kind of life that I'm living. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, someone agrees. Why do I? <laughs> um, now, I grew up at a time of rampant anti-communism. Um, I grew up in Thatcher's heartlands, one of Thatcher's children, our generation were called. We were taught to be selfish, we were taught to believe that it's the law of the jungle, it's a dog-eat-dog -dog world, and that capitalism really is the ultimate expression of human nature. Yeah? And that yes. by being selfish, by thinking only of ourselves, by just fighting only for you and maybe you know, your offspring, um, you're just reflecting reality. And that if society teaches you to be that way, it's because that's how people are. Um, bourgeois ideology was truly in the ascendant when I was growing up. And there was no one really countering this barrage of propaganda. We, you know, we had English literature lessons where we read Animal Farm. We had English literature lessons where we read Animal Farm and learned to repeat that Stalin was a crazy, murdering, stupid uh, butcher uh, and Trotsky was the true leader of the revolution. Uh, we had history lessons where we learned that Trotsky led the army, you know, the Red Army to victory and um, Stalin somehow hoodwinked and then later, um, you know, personally uh, bullied the Soviet people into following him. Mm -hmm. um, what was the aim of all of this? The aim was to teach us that revolution is pointless, that no matter what your intentions, if you try to change society, it will go wrong, and to negate the real building of socialism in the Soviet Union by slandering the leader of that building, by slandering Stalin, by telling you that Stalin was an evil murderer, you basically say that everything that was achieved in the Soviet Union wasn't achieved, it didn't happen, it wasn't true. Um, we were taught all sorts of stupid truisms. I mean, you just learn to repeat them. It just becomes, you know, these things become axioms because people say them often enough, you know. Mm. Power corrupts. Absolute power corrupts absolutely. They're the kind of things people say to you and they think they've clinched the argument. You know, they don't have a clue what they're talking about, but they've learned to say them over and over again. And, and whenever you talk about social to people, they come out with the same things to you. It's a nice idea in theory. It can never work in practice. It's never been done, has it? And people can say it's never been done, socialism's never been built, because we've been taught all these lies about the Soviet Union and about Stalin's leadership of the Soviet Union. Um, Anti-Soviet slanders are in every field of life. I did a music degree, it's amazing how it creeps in. You, know, it's amazing. you wouldn't think you could go and study music at university and get you know, several times a week some kind of anti-communist slander comes in. You know, the great music of Stravinsky and Shostakovich Oh, was produced at the barrel of Stalin's gun. You know? <laughs> Somehow or other, they made great music. It would have been much better if Stalin hadn't been there, obviously. If they'd have managed to escape to the West, which obviously what they really wanted to do, everything would have been much better for them. You know, the fabulous childcare and maternity provision provided by the Soviet <laughs> Union. Oh, the children were treated like automatons. You know, the mothers were forced to work. Uh, the professional care was impersonal, it was uncaring. Um, all the artists, musicians, dancers, gymnasts, athletes that were produced, um, of such amazing quality by the Soviet Union. They were coerced, they were overtrained. It's not really human, uh, you know, to be so good at things. <laughs> um, the victory of the Red Army over fascism. You know, oh, the soldiers were starving. They were forced to fight. Their best commanders have all been shot by Stalin, probably personally. <laughs> um, and to cap all of this hostility from the official sources, from the press, or from the school curriculum, uh, from the media, we grew up with a left-wing movement that was pretty much saying the same thing. <laughs> Denouncing and disowning Stalin and all the achievements of socialism from people in the trade unions, people in the Labour Party, the Socialist Workers' Party, the Communist Party. These were the people that you came up against who told you they were, they were socialist, 
that they believed in, you know, the working class. But they all agreed, when I was growing up, from, from whichever one of these shades of left you cared to talk to, they would all tell you, Stalin was a mass murderer, <coughs> probably Mao was too, Kim Il-sung the same. Socialism has never been put into practice anywhere. Marx wouldn't have approved of Lenin's revolution. Lenin wouldn't have approved of Stalin's building of socialism. <laughs> so essentially, every step of the way, our generation, and probably several before and several after, have been demoralised. They've been cut off from their own heritage, cut off from the knowledge that another world is possible and that they're capable of building it, cut off from the science of revolution. They've been cut off from the science of revolution and from the ideology that offers them hope for a future free from war, poverty, unemployment, homelessness, degradation and disease. Such has been the success of this sustained propaganda campaign that even the few socialists who did defend the Soviet Union when I was young, they didn't do a very good job of it. You know, they, they, we feel, we were taught to feel so culturally alienated. It's hard to bring it to life. It's hard to believe it really was as good as you wanted to say it was. Um, repeated assertions that I talked about earlier, you know, they, they create an atmosphere, they, the overwhelming associations we have about what life in the Soviet Union and Eastern Europe were like, you know, inhospitable, joyless. Uh, we think of gulags in Siberia. Everything's grey, everybody's a bit of an automaton. There's no, there's no choice, there's no inspiration, there's no magic to life. You know, Stalin's name is a swear word. You can't use it, it's synonymous with fear and loss of liberty, with evil KGB, with big brother culture. Um, so that even those who've understood in theory that yes, socialism is a good thing, and think that probably what happened in the Soviet Union might have been all right. They, were, they, didn't, they couldn't find the enthusiasm. They couldn't overcome this, this, this barrage of propaganda that had been instilled into them, all this prejudice, to actually stand up proudly and say, and find out for themselves, and say, you know what? This is, this is nonsense. This is, not the, this is not the truth about socialism. This is not the truth about the Soviet Union. 